and welcome to this episode of For Your Consideration. My name is Guy, and today we're talking to a board game designer by the name of Christopher Dravers. Christopher, hello and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. My absolute pleasure. Now, Christopher, you've been a role player for quite some time, haven't you? Yep, yep. Long time. Uh, since junior high, so we're going back almost 20 years, I think. <laughs> right, 20, yep. 20 years. So, so then how do you go from being a game master to being a board game designer? Because, I mean, I suppose ultimately all, all game masters design dungeons and yep. maps and things. So we, we're kind of doing it anyway. But how did you get get into designing a board game? Sure. So it actually happened. I was living out in the suburbs of Chicago for the majority of my life. And then, you know, I found I was coming out to Chicago more and more often to see different, you know, friends and stuff out here. And back in the burbs, I had been running a setting that more or less had lasted since I began GMing all the way through. So a good 20 years of of story there. And when I moved out to the city, it was like a whole different group of friends, a whole different, you know, like interests and things like that. So I decided, you know, it might be time to start a new setting. And that setting ended up being, you know, this kind of steampunk, diesel punk world of Spiral. Um, and it was fresh, it was new. And that's what we played in for a good two and a half, almost three years. Um, and then there was a local convention out here, uh, like a board gaming convention that me and, you know, a couple of those uh, players had gone to. And we're like, well, we consume so much board games. We love so much board games. Why don't we get into that space? Why don't we actually become creators instead of just consumers? So the first thing we thought about is, is what is the setting for it? What kind of games do we like? And we like story driven, um, engaging sort of thematic board games so we decided let's take this world that we kind of developed as players and game masters and turn it into you know the setting for this game right right okay fantastic but i mean now it's one step last not last week the week before i sent to seth skorkowski who's an author and a, a, you know mm -hmm. he's written a couple of novels and i i asked him all right so so the inspiration is there to do it but then how do you start i mean where did you even begin uh, that very first day when we got back home, it was like, you know, a, a trip to Staples to buy some office supplies and start, you know, uh, jotting notes on note cards, dry erase boards. There was a lot of energy that day and that first week. And that um, kind of carried us through. The nice thing is that it's me um, and two of my best friends, one of them I've known since high school, and then um, somebody else I met when I came to the city. So we each kind of encourage each other to keep going on the various different areas of the project that they're responsible for. So I'm kind of the creative director. So I handle, you know, art and story and things like that. But then, you know, our social media guy, you know, he takes care of that. Our physical production guy, which I think is the most boring part, he loves. So, you know, he talks to printers and, and things like that and handles margins and bleeds and all that nonsense that would bore right. me to tears. So we each have kind of our own individual passions there and uh, we encourage each other without stepping on each other's toes. So it helps to have friends doing it with you. I don't think it's something I could have done alone for sure. Right, right. And of course, as you say, you're creative director because it's, well, you've yeah. been a GM for a long time. Have you found that that's helped you in terms of developing the game? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, it helps me to give kind of these pieces in the game a, a personality and a life. So it goes beyond like a piece on the board and it helps, it helps me to help players get invested by having that background of being a storyteller first and kind of a, you know, a a rules focused person second um, because I do want it to tell that story when you're sitting down and playing I want you to feel like you have become a character you've chosen your your mission and you've seen it through and there to be some impact there um, so being a GM helps you kind of figure out how to invoke certain emotions in people via a rule set so it's definitely been helpful Right, absolutely. So, so now we've sort of spoken about how you come up with the idea. So what's the actual game? What is Iron Rise? Take me through sure. that. So Iron Rise, it's named after sort of the, the capital city in the setting. Um, it, the setting itself is a very uh, sort of dystopian, fascist, uh, tyrannical kind of setting that the heroes exist in um, and the villains exist in. It's a team v team uh, kind of set up there. So it's a 
couple people playing heroes, a couple people taking on the role of villains. And the goal is to tip the balance of this world one way or the other, for good or for evil. And that happens by, you know, accomplishing your heroic endeavors if you're a hero and your heroic side quest or accomplishing your evil schemes if you're a villain and your um, torments, they're called kind of the villain side quest. So by, you know, working through those, you will tip the balance one way or the other. And there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing that over the course of the game. Um, you know, the, the schemes and endeavors are kind of what give the characters their personality. Those are your, your missions that you're after. And we have dozens of those in the game. So the replayability from that perspective, we think is very strong. You know, you're never going to have a character with the exact same motivation combinations in the game. Um, so you get to play it differently every time. And then the heroes and villains themselves play very differently um, when you're at the table. So, and they all have their own unique special rules and things like that, that uh, kind of dictate their play style. Um, so that's kind of the game in, in a nutshell. Um, I think the core mechanic of the game that we were really proud of is kind of called the, the challenge. It's a very poker like kind of setup. Um, we wanted a game and that's something that was very important to us in the beginning that didn't use uh, the randomness of dice to determine outcomes. So each side has called, it's called an asset deck, a hero asset, uh, asset deck and a villain asset deck. And those cards in there are what you would use to accomplish the challenges. So you're going to have a, a, like a hand of cards and you're going to decide how you play those cards on your turn. Are you going to use them to accomplish missions? Are you going to use them to enhance your character? to interfere with the other player. And then when it's not your turn, you may need those cards to stop somebody whose turn it currently is from doing certain things. So, you know, I don't want to necessarily use the word resource management because that invokes like a certain um, type of game in people's minds, but you have a hand of cards and you have to decide, am I going to go all out with them in my turn? Am I going to save them to interfere with other people's? How am I going to use them? So it's about managing that. Um, and, you know, during a challenge, you would use those cards to oppose the other player and they get laid face down, you know, every time you, you make a play. So nobody really knows till the very end, did the other player go all in? Did he just bluff you to get your good cards out? Um, did you go all in and now you've got nothing to help your team for the rest of the, the cycle, you know? So that was our goal was to create something with a little bit of anticipation that went beyond just hoping the die comes up as a six instead of a one. Right. Right. I happen to absolutely, absolutely adore those games. And there's not a lot of games out there that do that. Some of them that sort of spring to mind are the Battlestar Galactica game yeah. where you're sort of voting on things. And then there's a Star Wars um, LCG uh, well, it's not that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, that have that sort of betting psychological element, which I absolutely, absolutely adore. Okay, so so you started with this 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 board game project. Um, you decided this is how it was going to work, and I, I think it's lovely, lovely way it's going to work. And Thank and you. people can can see playthroughs and that sort of thing. We'll put the links up. There's there's some stuff you were on on. Uh, where are the videos? Um, so we do have them all up on our Kickstarter page. They should be up on our website too, and I can get you all of those links as well. Um, we did, uh, there's a local um, kind of podcast channel here in Chicago called One Shot that does um, like a lot of filmings of playthroughs and things like that. So we were able to use their studio to get a really great playthrough up. Um, I think we might have a playthrough video up on our World Anvil page too with the rest of the, uh, the information. Fantastic. I'm very excited to hear you say World Anvil. Talk to me about World Anvil. What did you use that for? Sure. Um, so World Anvil, uh, I discovered maybe in late January. I've been um, in there. Uh, they, it's called like the, the God tier over there. So I've been part of that um, kind of pantheon of like first run through players and GMs on there for a long time. Um, it's been very influential for me. Like it's been the impetus that helps me keep cranking along on just my regular RPG setting, but also we took that and developed the board games setting on there as well. So for people that really want to delve into the story aspect of Iron Rise, everything is there. There's articles on the cities, the characters, the um, you know specific kind of weird sciences that are there. Some of the schemes and things are up. So 
you know, that's something that's always evolving. I think just today I put up an article about one of the airships that uh, one of the heroes uses that's kind of unique to him, the, uh, the Ceylon. Um, but yeah, World Anvil is, it's one, an amazing community. Everybody there is just super great. Uh, Demetrius, who runs it, has been a huge help in getting, you know, the game looked at in that community. Um, but there's nothing else like it out there. The World right. Anvil is just amazing for world building. No, absolutely. Absolutely. We've actually formed an alliance, an official alliance between the, the channel and World Anvil, where we'll be uh, helping them with all sorts of wonderful things because we, we derive such benefit from them. That's why I'm quite interested to see what your experience was with I them. I think I actually, I actually discovered it from the video that you put up on um, Game Master Assets, uh, like, right. like five like things you know, Game Master should be using. And that was one of them that I followed up on immediately. Well, that's fantastic. Well, well, that's lovely to hear. I'm very glad that, that you found uh, Demetrius's course because he is a wonderful bloke. Okay, so, so you, you've now got this board game. You've, you've got it onto World Anvil. Now you've got it onto Kickstarter. And yep. by the time this video airs, uh, you'll have about two weeks left of Kickstarter. Yep. How's that been going for you? I mean, because obviously you, you've, got to, you've got to figure out how to now make this board game. Is that right? So is that why it's on Kickstarter? So, yeah, so I guess kind of the, the unique reason why, you know, a lot of Kickstarters, I guess, are showing off a product that they need your money to then develop, right? So with us, it was a little bit different. We took the four years to make the game. So it's 100% complete right now with the exception that we need the funds to print it, right? So all of the rules are done. The play testing is done. All the characters are there. We have about 10 like demo copies that are out there right now with like the boxes complete and everything. So it's, it's not one of those where like we need people's funds to develop a whole bunch more. We just need it to get to the printer and actually get the game on the shelves. Um, so I think that's one interesting aspect of our project versus some of the other ones is that, you know, there's no risk in us just giving up on it. It's done already. Um, and then, you know, the process of Kickstarter itself, I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, like an anxiety nightmare sometimes. <laughs> um, our first days, our first uh, full week was great. We got to about 50% in the first week alone, which is awesome. Um, week two and three are always traditionally very, very slow for Kickstarter, and that's, you know, a good source of anxiety. However, we have a lot of friends and family that are currently like upping their pledges and kind of keeping it going during that lull in the middle. So we went from week one ending at about 50% to right now, um, which is week, the end of week two, we're at uh, it's like 79.5%. So we're well on our way. Um, we hope to be funded uh, based on some conversations with more friends and family this weekend. We hope to be funded by early next week. So that'll give us two weeks to work on our stretch goals. Um, our stretch goals for this particular product, uh, being that everything is done, we didn't want to um, sort of like bribe people into spending more with like, we'll give you a couple more characters if you give us some more you know, money. So what we wanted to do is to make our stretch goals about quality improvements to the actual game itself. So you know, if we hit certain goals, we're going to be able to afford better quality board or better quality dice or include, um, you know, kind of metal turn counters and things like that. So we want to give the whole game as soon as we find, we just want to improve the quality of it. And that's what our stress goals are all about. Right. And that's absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, so I think that's, that, that, that's a very good point that you raised there in terms of the Kickstarter is that it's already made. It's just now a yeah. case of, of getting it printed. And I, I, there are a lot of online resources, you know, um, uh, I forget the name of the website offhand, but you know they 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 will do the entire thing for you. They'll yeah. print the board, they'll do the pieces and the cards and that sort of thing. Is that something that you're using, or are you sort of you've got your 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 printer specialist? Yeah, uh, that's definitely something we're uh, we're using. Our um, physical production guy, his name's Danny. That's kind of his world specifically, but. Um, we have a couple uh, in mind. Um, we're looking at Black Box, which uh, fulfills all of Cards Against Humanity's products. We have quite a few friends in that company. It's a local Chicago company, so we know a lot of people mm -hmm. there, and that helps. Um, and we also have uh, Ad Magic, um, which is like out of Jersey, but they do their printing in, in China. So that's an opportunity there. 
Um, and then Panda, which is out of Canada, was our original go-to and may still be. A lot of which printer we choose ends up um, being based on how many copies we find because they all have different minimum print sizes at the end of the day. So that's going to be one of the biggest factors in who do we go with is who will, you know, how many copies do we need to fulfill. Right, right, absolutely. Then I want to talk just briefly, and um, I'll bring up pictures, but the artwork that you've yeah. chosen for the cards and things, uh, it's quite, uh, well, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Thank you. Um, it, it, again, it sort of harkens back, there, there was a wonderful uh, game which I had to leave in South Africa when I moved to Japan, sadly, but uh, it's called A Touch of Evil, yeah. and it had photographic actors and things yeah. in various poses now yours is similar to that how did that come about how did you decide on sure. that so that um came about because this big group of friends that we have out here um one a lot of them are into to cosplay you know and there's just so many great steampunk like cosplayers out there um we also have a lot of them are so those models are um, all people that we know. They're all part of our, our friend group, um, which is great. Um, but most of them are either professional improv actors, um, burlesque dancers, and just some cosplay enthusiasts. Um, we have a chain mail artist in there as well. Uh, so just people who are part of the art community that really like doing that. So costuming wasn't necessarily hard it was something that a lot of them just wanted to do on their own um, and they put together some great costumes I gave a little bit of direction as to like what would this character look like and where and then you guys bring whatever you have to the table and we'll make it work um, you know so that that was a great experience um, and then we have a lot of great uh, people that we know in the community that are um, great digital artists and photographers, uh, the folks at um, Muscular Clown Studios here in Chicago did great work on getting the photos done. And we had some other great people actually doing the digital manipulation. So that's what the majority of the art would be is kind of this great, um, slightly cheesy, but fun, like um, cosplay steampunk uh, aesthetic. And then we do have a lot of art pieces that are more like hand-drawn art that are going to be on the back of the cards and on the side quests and things like that, which I have all that art up on, on World Anvil, which um, and then I'm able to tag all the artists and stuff on there too. So uh, we have a lot of that um, in play as well. Which is fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. And I know people are keeping track of me times I say fantastic, but it is it's absolutely <laughs> wonderful. It's lovely. Um, I think I think the idea of using friends who are cosplayers is is... It, to me, that's almost, um, there's a fine line between obviously using family and friends and things yeah. and getting a professional product, but the product is definitely professional. I mean, the, as you say, the look is fantastic. You've had lots of different companies working on it. And these guys, as you say, are semi-professional. So um, mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a good step. Um, and even if it was temporary artwork, just to, to showcase what you would have had in mind if you had to go with professional costumers sure. and, and, and actors and things, I think would be a great, a great first step. So for someone out there who's a GM, a player mm -hmm. in role playing, what would be your advice to developing their first game? Sure. Um, I mean, the first thing to know is no matter how long you think it's going to take, like double or triple it, everything just takes way longer. So you, you have to be patient. You know, it's the idea that you come up with that pushes you in the direction to start developing. Like you, you have to hold on to that. You have to hold on to that passion because, you know, for us, when we first started, we thought like, you know, we came up with it in, in April uh, and then we thought, well, we would have this thing live the following October for Kickstarter. And it just, it doesn't work that way. Nothing moves that, um, that quick. So you got to be patient and willing to um, keep that fire going through a lot of long lulls. Um, and then, you know, as far as what kind of game do you want to develop? What is your game going to be like? It's got to be the games that you enjoy playing because you're going to lose that passion real quick if you're like somebody that likes um it's the term is like ameritrash games the very like thematic um sort of pulpy games and then you know everybody else involved wants to do like a, a euro resource management game you're you're 
you're not going to have the the mental stamina to 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 do all of it, you know, to, to suffer through it. Um, so you got to do what you, what you like. And that's why I think it's really easy to take, um, not easy, but it's just natural to take your game that you love running, that you is living for you and translate that into, um, you know, a set of rules that people can play through in 90 minutes instead of, you know, an hour every week. Right, 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 yeah. right. God. Okay, so I, I think that's that's also very good advice, and I think uh, and possibly having some kind of support base. I mean, I know you mentioned there's, there's three of you that sort of form the triumvirate behind the game, yeah. um, and and that sounds to me like it's fairly important to have people there who who perhaps challenge you to make sure that your rules are robust, but are also there to to support you, as you say. Yeah, that is that is really important. And I can't stress that enough. You have to have people involved who have equal say to you to check you. Because, you know, as a game master, and I guess even anecdotally, there's a character in the game called Prime Minister um, Beckett Blackwell. And uh, he is kind of the main villain of the setting. Um, there's a very sort of like Lovecraftian thing going on with him behind the scenes and what he really is versus what people perceive he is. But, you know, and that's something that like, I want this guy to be powerful in game. This guy has to be, you know, end all be all. But then there's two other guys there to check me to say, well, if somebody picks that character, you know, the game balance is totally messed up. So, um, you know, so you need people to, to check the creativity, um, aspect of it the storytelling aspect of it and remind you that it's it's a game and it's a game and a story and not just a story um so that helps a ton um and we we check each other all the time um, on various different things like when i see the project moving a little more away from story and like hard game mechanics i check them um so yeah you have to have a good uh support group and it really helps to have equal partners in it um so no matter what your idea is, find somebody else that's just as into it and give them equal say. Mm, mm, mm. So then the next question is, because the game is done and all yep. that Kickstarter is, is really just about disseminating it out to the rest yep. of the world, what's next? Is there another board game that's going to come out of you? Sure. So, I mean, we're always thinking about expansions, like what other characters popped up in those, you know, three years that were entertaining that we could attach a rule set to, um, you know, what friends in the community, uh, you know, actors, burlesque dancers, whoever, maybe like fit the part. Um, what new mechanics can we bring into play? So definitely like expansions to Iron Rise would be, um, you know, the first way to go there. I guess my kind of pet passion would be to spin off some kind of role-playing version of it like a setting book and you know either our own rule set or you know some open gaming license rule set attached to the setting something along those lines so that's an interest of mine as well um, and then you know I'm always interested in different settings as well so maybe games that take place in you know a more traditional fantasy setting you know maybe something that gets away from individual characters and it's more like on a kingdom level or, you know, something along those lines. So a um, couple different things kind of bouncing around there, but I think the most immediate is probably going to be, you know, expansions to the game. Right. Right. Absolutely. Well, I hope there's room for a great GM card in there. I can be a villain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to fly you out here and you're welcome to be a character. There we go. All right. Well, I, uh, I think that hopefully has inspired you, everyone yep. who's watching to go out and do the same. I do hope that you will support this uh, Kickstarter project. As you say, it's almost funded, but there's always room for more. And uh, the game looks absolutely beautiful. I've been bringing up images as this interview has been going on um, and uh, all the links below you can go and find everything that you need to 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 find on that Christopher thank you ta for taking time and sort of giving us this glimpse a very positive glimpse into the world of board game designing my last question to you is would you go through it all over again if you if you had to start from scratch knowing now what you know what you didn't know then yeah, no, I, I absolutely would. I mean, the process has been so worthwhile. I mean, not just because of, you know, what we're turning into a physical product, but the people I've met along the way, so many different supportive, amazing people from 
you know, just people here in my local community to different Facebook groups to, you know, discovering World Anvil and those guys. And there's just so many, my circle is so much bigger than it was four years ago because of this project. So that alone is is 100% worth it. Um, and I definitely knowing what I know now could tackle it in, in a uh, in a much smoother fashion than we did in the beginning. But, you know, it's first time through and you just you figure it out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, thank you so much for being for being on the uh, show today. And thank you for joining us. If you like what you saw, hit the like button. If you want to see more, of course, hit that subscribe button. Head on over to Iron Rise uh, Kickstarter and support them. Get yourself a, a copy of the game. They can if they go into the higher tiers. That's right. They get a copy of the game. Yep, yep. absolutely. Yep. You can do that. It's a really, really, really good game. And uh, I know for one, I can't wait for it to, to, to launch so I can get a copy of it and start playing. Until next time, however, I wish you and yours the very happiest of, well, game designing. <laughs>